Okay, so today we are uh, going to merge you know, the two strange two topics that we see together: programming in JavaScript and uh, uh, creating uh, you know, web pages. And we'll have a look at how JavaScript works uh, in the browser. Okay, so the browser we know already <coughs> includes uh, a JavaScript interpreter. Uh, but for, for now, we know uh, we, we know how to load HTML pages, HTML content in the page. So if we want to add the interactivity, we want to add our scripts, uh, our JavaScript code into a web page, uh, first of all, we must load the script from the web, the web page itself. So in uh, HTML, we have a tag called the script that we can use to load a JavaScript file, and the browser will the file and execute it right away. So we'll execute all the instructions that we'll find uh, it will find in the in this file uh, that can be downloaded from you know, the local computer or can be downloaded from any URL that you provide. So we'll down, the, the browser will download the file and start uh, after the file has been you know, re, uh, reach, uh, received, we start executing the instructions therein. Um, the script can also be used uh, in an inline way. So inside an HTML page, you can also have some instructions inside the script. Uh, but uh, for obvious reasons of reuse of the code and uh, also ease of editing, uh, it's much better to have an external file and uh, write our functions there. OK. Um, where do we put the script tag? So from the browser point of view, the strict script tag may be anywhere. Uh, and you will just get executed as the browser finds it. So it can be at the beginning or the middle or, or the, uh, the bottom of the page, wherever you want. But there are some places that are better than others. So uh, theoretically, the best place to have a script is in the heading section of the page. So uh, you have all the decoration, all the style sheets, loading, and so on. Um, and you know, traditionally, they told you, put the script uh, inside the head. Uh, putting the script inside the head of the document is a problem because uh, the script is, is executed right away at the beginning of the file. So what happens is that uh, two uh, bad things happen. The first bad thing is that the loading of the HTML page is blocked by the loading of the script. So the browser will read the first lines and then find the script tag download the JavaScript, execute the JavaScript, and then continue processing the page. So um, loading the HTML will be slower because we have to wait until the JavaScript is downloaded and executed. So we don't like it so much. And second problem is that when the script, uh, the, the code, is executed, the HTML of the page has not been loaded yet hmm? because we are still in the first line of the file. So all the body hasn't, hasn't been seen yet at all. So the JavaScript cannot do anything on the page because the page doesn't exist yet. Hmm? So there was a, say, a second best practice that was developed uh, along the years, uh, historically, to put the script as the last statement uh, in the file. Well, syntactically cannot be the last statement because we still have the closing of the body and the HTML tags, but you know, the last possible position. So in this position, it's better because we first load all the page, <coughs> so the page is displayed immediately by the browser. Then we load the script, uh, and when the script runs, uh, the page is already being loaded. And so the script can access the content of the page hmm, and modify it or read information from there and so on. Okay, so these are the, the historical suggestions. Um, this is just a timeline so saying that if we are uh, we have the, the script in the head, uh, we are uh, blocking the part of the page, uh, and if we have the, at the end, uh, we can, uh, okay, we are not blocking the part of the HTML, but we are starting to load the script. Uh, we are not starting to load the script until all the pages have been loaded. So we are introducing here a delay uh, after the page has been loaded and before the page becomes interactive, so the JavaScript can do it's work. So we are not blocking the page, but we are in some way delaying the interactivity of the page. Hmm? 
uh, there are better ways uh, along the years they developed uh, alternative uh, say loading methods that are supported by modern browsers um, and they are <coughs> activated by uh, two attributes uh, they may be async or defer in the script text so uh, the idea is that we are still putting the script tag in the head of the document but instead of loading it right away at the beginning of the file we are telling the browser to load that asynchronously and this both of these attributes uh, are changing the way you know, in which the browser loads the, the JavaScript and executes it in a different way I think uh, that what it thinks what you think is that the loading and the execution of the scripts uh, are totally in parallel with the loading of the page and the loading and execution of other possible scripts in the page because nobody is telling us that there can only be one script you may have many scripts elements in the same page so if we have many of them if if all of them are async then we they will the browser will start downloading all of them in parallel and as soon as the javascript arrives it will start executing it while loading the page okay during the load of the page so the timeline is in like in this picture the browser will start parsing the HTML it will find the script tag so we start uh, a downloading of the script and the download goes in parallel with the processing of the of the HTML when the script is downloaded the browser will stop or pause temporarily the execution or the analysis of the web page and will execute the script right away just in the first possible moment in which it has been loaded and then we will resume the loading and the parsing of the HTML page uh, in this way the script uh, will execute uh, as soon as possible but of course it will only see a partial web page hmm, because it's not uh, completed yet so um, we cannot rely on the on the information that is in the in the web page itself uh, and the other problem is so uh, this script cannot rely on the uh, availability of the web page and at the same time if there are more than one scripts uh, they more than one script uh, uh, they cannot depend on each other so you cannot rely on something or some information or some function that is in some library because maybe your code will load faster and will be executed before the library has been loaded so you don't tell the functions yet so the order of the execution is unpredictable hmm? um, the alternative and the better way of doing that is using a, a, an improvement of this asynchronous loading mechanism uh, that is activated by the defer attribute and the deferred script loading means that I will start uh, loading as soon as possible but I will defer delay the execution of the code until the page is being loaded and the, the various scripts may load in parallel so asynchronously in any order but they will be executed in order in order in which I'm loading the script so it's totally predictable I know that the browser will first load the web page then execute the scripts in order what I'm doing is that I'm zeroing out the download time because download will happen in parallel with the page processing okay like in this second picture uh, the browser passes the page in parallel with that you can start downloading the script but the execution of the script will be delayed deferred until the whole page has been built okay so when we execute the script we are sure that uh, we have the page uh, built and but we don't have any loading delay because the loading has been done in parallel okay so this is a better solution if we want to have a predictable execution and relatively uh, fast downloads because it will happen in parallel uh, and we'll try to load we need to use always use this format okay script defer in the head of the document uh, this script can be repeated many times so every time we load a JavaScript file it will add to the previous ones I mean that uh, 
conceptually, if I'm loading more than one JavaScript file, the result is equivalent to concatenate, downloading and concatenating all the files in one big file, and then execute that. Okay, so there is no namespaces here. So uh, everything that is defined in one file is visible on the, on the other. Hmm? Everything is at the top level. It's not very nice, but the way JavaScript is working. Uh, there's another detail that uh, the script tag uh, doesn't have the, the, the short closing format. So normally when you have a tag and you don't, you don't have anything in between the start and the end of the tag, okay, instead of writing slash and tag, you just have a slash in the opening one, okay? Like, you know, br slash close or image slash close, okay? Um, with the script tag, you cannot do that. It's not recommended because older browsers will not recognize the script there. In a way, script is changing the syntax of, of its uh, body parsing, so in a way, it's a, a bit delicate. Okay, so we say that uh, after loading the, uh, the, the scripts, uh, all the well, JavaScript file contains executable instructions and especially definitions. I'm expecting to find definition of uh, variables and functions there. Okay, where are these variables defined actually? Where do they live? Hmm? We have a so-called global context, so a namespace in which uh, there already have, are some defined objects that we can use, you know, the standard library objects, so we can access them. There are some objects defined by the browser itself, and then all the, the, all the objects that we define, variables that we define, go and fall into the same namespace, into this global namespace. Our code will only access those information, those variables, those functions that are defined in this global namespace, which is a partially limited environment. Okay, we, our JavaScript code, we will do only what the APIs provided by the browser will offer them. So the JavaScript code cannot read a file on my disk, or cannot uh, or modify something in my computer, or cannot uh, understand what other windows do we have open on, on the same browser or even on, on, the, on the desk, okay? It only has some limited information. It runs in a protected environment because after all, we are running the, on my computer the code that someone else wrote on a website that I'm visiting. So when I'm visiting a website, uh, the code, JavaScript code from another programmer is running on my computer without me asking for it, without me installing anything, just by the fact of that you are visiting a web page. Okay, so of course I should trust that this JavaScript cannot do damage or not too much. Hmm? And it, so it works in a, a limited environment where it has access to the JavaScript standard library, of course. We can have strings, we can have arrays, and so on. It can access to uh, a, a set of objects uh, that control the interaction with the browser, basically opening a new window, resizing, something like that. And uh, most importantly, it can access uh, the current content of the document. So uh, a JavaScript file is loaded within a web page, in the content of a, of a web page, and so it can access the content of this very same web page where it was loaded. It cannot access any other web page that you may have opened in your browser. Okay, the web page is, in, is represented by this document object model, and so every programming that we do to add interactivity to a web page will go through this DOM. Hmm? Um, and simply put, uh, all the scripts uh, are put together and they're executed together in the same context, uh, unless we go to the modules, which are more of a complex way of structuring information. We'll see it later. Okay, so how is the life within the browser? The browser doesn't have a keyboard, doesn't have a, a screen. The JavaScript code runs uh, and it should, in a way, react uh, to the user actions. When I run 
Okay, imagine I load a JavaScript uh, HTML page and then it runs some code. What can this code do right away in the first millisecond after the page is being loaded? There's not much it can do. It can do something better after a while when the user starts interacting with the page, starts moving the mouse, starts ty typing stuff, starts clicking buttons or whatever. So the actual execution of a JavaScript code is mainly made of, of <coughs> sorry, of reacting to some events that come from user actions. Okay, so the main way of the integration, communication between the browser and the JavaScript is through a continuous flow of events. Whenever the user is doing something or whenever something happens in general in the browser, the browser will broadcast uh, events. Say, okay, the user moved the mouse, the user clicked here, uh, a download is terminated, a timeout has expired, or whatever. There are thousands of events per second emitted by the browser, and uh, we can attach or handle or listen to any of these events. Our code will be made of small callbacks small or not so small, but uh, that will run in conjunction to, with an event, with, a, with the generation of an event. So every event uh, can be, has a, already has a predefined behavior. So for example, if you click on a link, the predefined behavior is the browser will lead you to a different page. If you click on a submit button, the, the behavior is uh, Submitting the form. If you click on none in any other part of the page, the, def the default behavior is do nothing. Okay? If you move the mouse, uh, the normal behavior is not doing anything uh, unless some elements uh, are the CSS styling reacts uh, to the mouse position. Or you can define in addition or in replacement to the, to the, to the default behavior our own behavior we can define our own behavior. So this is quite normal as a programming pattern for a user interface. The only problem is uh, that JavaScript is not uh, a concurrent language. It's a single threaded language. There is only just one, at most, one JavaScript instruction executing at a given time. I will say more, there is only one function being executed at the same time, at a given time. So how do you put together the fact that in a, in a synchronous reactive environment where snippets of code run in reaction to events and the fact that the code execution is serial? There's nothing going in parallel. Well, this happens thanks to a set of cues, five of cues. So what we have here, just to have a an overview, a big picture without going into much details how the uh, virtual JavaScript Java virtual machine is working. Uh, just imagine that we have uh, in JavaScript some memory that is divided into conceptual blocks. One is the heap where we have all the objects. Okay, we are, when we create an object, we will be allocated into some memory space hmm, where it lives. We are not interested in that. And then some part of the memory that will uh, remember the call stack. So the currently executing functions and the function that they call. So if JavaScript is doing nothing, the call stack will be empty. Uh, when I run the code, imagine our JavaScript file, uh, when I execute the code, it will say push into the call stack uh, a main function, let's say, is not an explicit function, it's the main uh, code that we have, and we start executing that. If our code calls other functions, those functions will be pushed in, this, in the stack, of course, uh, as they call each other, and when they return, they will pull off of the stack. It's normal sequential behavior. But at a given point, the stack will become empty when the program finishes. 
in some way, where there's no longer any sequential execution to do. In a normal environment, in a normal language, that will, be, will terminate the program, but not in JavaScript. The JavaScript will still keep running inside the browser, even if it doesn't have anything to do, because all the um, sequential instructions are being executed. So the, it's normal for the call stack to be empty, so I'm not executing anything. But what happens here is that there are some events that we decided to listen for, we decided to manage, we decided to define a callback for handling these events. Whenever, this happens, whenever an event that we have registered, registered for handling happens, the handler function, so the callback that needs to be executed, is put into a queue, which is called the event loop. So an event uh, that somebody clicks on the button, the page has finished loading, uh, uh, an image uh, has already been, uh, uh, we finished downloading an image or a file or something like that. Many types of events. As they happen, they cannot be managed uh, and in parallel. So as interesting events happen, they are uh, appended, added at the end of the queue. Hmm? If, of course, we have defined an event handler for those. If I'm clicking somewhere that, and that click is not handled, they would just be ignored. But if we have defined an event handler, that event handler will be pushed there. So the JavaScript interpreter, what does it do? It will, if the call, st if the call stack is empty, it will check the event queue. If there is a callback queued here, it will push the callback in the call stack and start running it. Okay, so starting to run code in the callback until termination. So that code we can call other functions, can set other callbacks or whatever. And when everything returns, the call stack will be empty again. When the call stack will be empty again, JavaScript will check whether we have another event handler to process. If so, I will put that specific event handler in the call stack and start running it. So, JavaScript is running sequentially. Some code that we put in the call stack, that we start with the function in the call stack and everything it calls. When that snippet of sequential code terminates its execution, then uh, the call stack will be empty and we can just pick another micro task to execute, another callback to run. Yeah. Yeah, for how do I, so the question was how do I listen to this event? Uh, we'll see in a moment that we define an event handler. So we, I'm telling the browser which events I'm interested in and which callbacks uh, I want to execute. So it's something that I would write in the, in the first line of the code, I will register event handler. Okay, we'll come in, in a second. So uh, this means that if I have a callback that runs indefinitely or is very slow, it will block everything. Every other behavior in the page will be blocked. Also the predefined behaviors. So the page will, be, will freeze. The idea is that we should do small amounts of work and uh, then go away. Leave the CPU to some other task. The picture is not full for the moment because we still have promises that have a separate queues for prom pending promises, but I don't want to make it too much complex at the moment. The basic idea is that uh, uh, when something is scheduled, due for an event or a timeout or whatever, when something is scheduled, sooner or later it will be executed. First rule. Second rule, once uh, some sequential code starts, it will never be interrupted. The only way to interrupt the execution of sequential code is whether that code terminates or awaits. The await keyword is a special case, okay? Or terminating a portion of the code and then resuming it later. There's a special uh, queue for that, for those kind of callbacks, hmm? partial callbacks. But if you imagine 
some promise-based code. Remember the first time we, we wrote some code for uh, querying the database? Everything is executed immediately, and then the code finishes. And then in parallel, uh, the query will happen, and then a callback uh, will be scheduled. But the, the initial code is run until termination immediately, and the call stack will be emptied. Hmm? So this is the way we are working. OK, so how we do, do we do the things, really? Uh, what kind of objects do we have access to in our environment? And it would be a bit different from what we have inside Node.js, because the, the environment is different. Okay. Apart from the basic function, basic object of the standard library, uh, the, the environment is different from Node.js to the browser. So the browser gives you, gives us two main objects, JavaScript objects. They are called window and document. Window represents the browser, the browser window in which. Uh, we are running. And the document represents the web page loaded inside that window. So whenever we have to interact with the browser, for example, close a tab or check whether some page has been loaded or is still loading, for example, or uh, navigate to a different page, we are we will talk to the window object. We will call methods in the window object. Whenever we interact with the page, with the content of the page, so reading what's in the screen, setting up an event handler, we call methods on the document object. And so the window object is not, well, it's useful, but it's not the main uh, object that we are going to interact with because most of, because most of the work with the, to interact with the document. Uh, the window provides us the console. So console.log works also in the browser. And uh, uh, the console usually gets just thrown away unless you open the inspector, the debugger in the, in the browser, then you can see what you log into the console. Um, we have a history that allows me to control the navigation, go forward and backward. So the, from the JavaScript code, we can control the uh, forward and backward arrows. Location is a property that corresponds to the current URL of the page. So if we change uh, window.location, we are actually navigating to a different page. And then there are some local storage uh, where we can store some information inside the browser. Hmm? So maybe when you go to a website and you return to it later, the website will still remember something about you. But because the JavaScript code from yesterday stores some information that can be retrieved later. Of course, uh, every, this information is sealed and separated from every, each and every website. So you cannot read the local store information that has been stored by another JavaScript from another website. But the interesting part, of course, is interacting with the document, hmm? the document object model. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex object. It's a complex uh, um, uh, of main methods. We'll try to find the, uh, or to study the, um, the, the main ones. Uh, if, you are more, uh, if you are interested in understanding more about the DOM, this is a suggested tutorial you can, that you can read. But basically, the DOM is a, Document object model. So it's an object model representing the document. The currently loaded document, live. So if the currently loaded document changes in some way, then the DOM representation changes also. And this is a bidirectional. If we change anything, any property, any node in that document object model, and we can change them because we have the method for doing that, then the web page will update immediately, synchronously, in real time. Okay, so our JavaScript code will see the web page has a tree of nodes that represent all the HTML elements. And we are able to manipulate all of these nodes. So do whatever we want on the content of the page. Of course, the content of the node initially is created by the browser when it loads and parses the HTML. And then we can change it dynamically in our code. 
Um, it's a tree of nodes. What kind of nodes do we have? There are some special, uh, we call them nodes, they are basically JavaScript classes, okay? Object types. We call them DOM nodes, just to remember that they are part of a tree. But they're nothing special. They're just objects. Um, in general, we call them nodes, and nodes may be elements. Mm, mainly, they are elements. And an element is an HTML tag. So there is an element representing the div, an element representing a peer, an element representing body, an element representing HTML, and so on. Um, so there are different subclasses, different HTML elements representing all the different types of tags. So in a page, you have a nesting of elements. What do we have uh, in addition to the nesting of the tags? We have attributes, source equal to, and so there's a, it's not displayed here, there's another type of, uh, of tag which is the attribute, it's not shown in the picture. So an element may have uh, one or more attributes attached to it. An image, an HTML image element will have some source attribute attached to it. And some text, and the text is uh, something which is included between the tags. So it's a text, so an, a tag can contain some text or some other tags. An element can contain a text or other element. And that's it. We are nesting elements inside the elements and at the, at the leaf level we have text. And each element may have some extra attributes which are the ones that we list in the tag definition. Uh, we can access to all of those. Uh, basically, the document node points here. The object called document points to the root of the tree, which is always the HTML tag. And then we have methods for navigating, searching, and modifying this tree. And these methods uh, use, uh, okay, the, the, the objects uh, no, in these methods are all of type node or element or, some, or text, or they may be often lists of these nodes. So for example, if I, uh, I'm in a table, this table is made of one, two, three, four rows, so there will be a method of, from the table node to give me the list of its children, of its rows. And so there's a, a special data structure which call, is called node list that sort of behaves like in a similar way to an array. It's not a real array, it's a more complex object because it's updated live, basically synchronized live with the page. But uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, officially it's a node list, uh, but it, it has the, main, uh, uh, the same, nearly the same uh, properties that we accept for an array. So in many cases we are not uh, aware of that. So how can we work, work with this? Uh, first of all, imagine we want to implement some functionality. Like, uh, I don't know, when I click on some elements, something, something else happens. When I click on a button, some, something changes. Imagine the score of the answers in our Q&A system. When I click on the vote button, the score should increase. So our code should at least find in, the, in all the nodes in the page where the button is and where the score is displayed in order to be able to change it to increment it. So a lot of, well, a group of methods are used to find DOM nodes in the page. We have document. We only have the reference to the first node, but we want to find the reference to some inner node in the page. We can search for this node in a many different ways. If we know the ID, we can use the document. You see, all of these are methods of documents of the DOM. We are asking the root node, please find me one of your children that has this specific ID, the ID attribute. The same ID attribute that we are using for CSS, so they are played well together. Or by tag name, it is not very, 
very used because it will give me all the P's, all the divs. And it's quite generic in a page. Uh, but you, we see the difference. Get element by ID is a singular, one element, because the ID is unique. Get elements by tag name is plural. So we return a, a node list because there may be many tags in the same page with the, uh, with the same element name. And also for the class name. All the elements with the class equal to info, information or error. There may be many elements that have this class applied, and so <clears throat> it returns a list of these elements. So it returns a node when only one can be expected, or a node list when more than one <coughs> can be expected. These are quite basic search methods, and there are more general search methods that uh, rely on this concept of CSS selectors. So we are able, well, we are no, used in CSS to make say, complex queries, like uh, using this, the selector uh, syntax. The P inside the div with the class information. It would be div.information space P, for example. And we know that it will select a group of elements. Okay, we can use the same syntax here. So we can use, a, a, we can create a, a selector string using the same syntax as CSS. The browser already knows how to parse that, so it's nice that it gives us access to this parsing engine. And will return me the first or all the elements, the nodes matching uh, that specific CSS selector. So instead of, mm, if I have an ID, I will go there with the ID. If I have a more complex description, of, for example, in our uh, picture here, all the rows uh, of this table. Maybe we have more tables, but uh, only this one is interesting. And so you can write a selector for selecting those rows elements. And we use it, and in JavaScript, we'll have a node list of all these TRs, or maybe only the first one, if I know that I am interested in the first one. I find uh, elements. If I, all these methods are normally applied to document, they will search through the whole tree, but these methods are also defined on any node, so I can uh, call uh, one of these methods also uh, on, a, on a reference to an internal node, and then it will only search in the subtree rooted or starting from that node. So we can do some sort of multi-step searches. From the document, uh, we get uh, get element by the main. It will give me an element with ID equal to main. I will store it into a variable, and this variable I will use it to find all the p that are inside the main in this way. Hmm? And it's the same as using CSS selector, you know, query, uh, query selector all main space p but we can do, you know, it's in a different step. Okay. Um, what do we do with this? So first of all, finding a node. Then we'll try to put everything together, huh? uh, but we need some ingredients. Once we have a node, we can navigate the local uh, surroundings of the node. So we have methods for Given a node, telling me which is its parent, which are its uh, siblings, which are its children. We have a, an array, a node list, called child nodes, and a, and a reference called parent node. So from any node, we can move up or down into the hierarchy. Or left and right, if I know what, is, what are my siblings in both directions. Of course, my previous sibling is the same as uh, one of the child nodes of my parent. Hmm? It's a well-formed tree. It's a tree. There are no, there are no loops in there. Um, and we can also <coughs> access the attributes of a node. So we can find a node, move around the node, and query the properties of that node. 
The properties of the node are, first of all, all the attributes that we define, plus all the style properties, all the CSS properties defined on that specific node. We can query them and we can modify them. All of them are mapped into properties, JavaScript properties of the object representing the node. So I want to check, uh, I have a tag with an ID attribute. I can access these attributes, uh, the value of this attribute with .id. Or, of course, you can use the, the square bracket syntax. There's nothing special here. We are just accessing a property of an object called ID, a JavaScript object. So they are mapping, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the attributes uh, of an object and the CSS properties of that object, of that node, into properties, JavaScript properties of that node itself. And this opens uh, a universe because every uh, DOM element has uh, thousands of different attributes if we think all the CSS properties that can be, uh, can be set. We can also, we can read and write attributes just by using the object property syntax or we also have some uh, uh, method for doing that in a more explicit way. Hmm? We'll Let's keep it for a moment. We um, can create new elements. And there is a method called create element. It's a method of, of document. So we are asking the document, I want to add a new line here. OK. Give me a p tag, an element, a new paragraph. OK, there is no new here. Uh, we cannot write a new. Uh, create by ourselves a new element because that will be detached from the current uh, DOM. So I, knew, I need to ask the DOM, please give me a new paragraph. So create element uh, div, create element p. Give me an element of this type. I can create an element. I can customize this element by setting classes, properties, or whatever. There's a very interesting property called inner text uh, that will set uh, the text inside the tag, or also an inner HTML that we set an HTML fragment that will be contained inside the tag. And so in creating a fragment of the page, I'm creating a fragment. And then I need to attach this fragment somewhere. When I'm creating an element, it will be say, outside the page. And then I will uh, insert it somewhere, for example, as a new child of a given element. Hmm? So there are all basic manipulation operations. We can create nodes, we can add new nodes to the current tree in many different ways. So there are many, all these methods have the same effect of adding a new, a new subtree. It's not just a single element, maybe also a tree of elements. So we can add it to a specific power, um, position in the current DOM. And many of these are redundant. We can do the same things with, the, with different um, methods. A pen child is the most, uh, say, frequently used one, but uh, depending on whether you want to create a new children or a new sibling, uh, there are different methods, OK? At the beginning or at the end of the list, uh, and, uh, OK. Uh, about properties, there are some special properties. And in particular, uh, we, are, no, we are used in the bootstrap uh, of styling the page by setting or deleting classes or changing the classes. Uh, there's a shortcut way of handling a list of classes, because in no, normally in HTML, if an element has many classes, they are represented as a string with the class name separated by spaces, which is quite inconvenient to work with no? from a programmatic point of view. And uh, the um, DOM breaks up the string into a list of classes. So the, every element, every node has a class list attribute 
which is a list of strings representing classes, and there are methods like add or remove or toggle to update this list. So if we want to add a, a class, uh, we just, just said add, uh, use the add method, and uh, it, does, it will handle all the duplicates, uh, so there's no problem of, uh, of concatenating uh, or ma also making up strings uh, or words. So ma managing uh, the classes of an element, uh, we can use the class name attribute that will give us a string. But it's better to use the class list uh, property that uh, maps the same information as a list of strings. So we can activate or deactivate selectively one of uh, uh, each of the classes of an element. And the same game is for the CSS style. There is a style property with hundreds of sub-properties. So if we want to uh, set uh, uh, display or hide uh, an element, uh, we can just modify the display CSS property. Okay, it's display none, display in line, uh, like we saw last week. Where is the display attribute? It's nested inside a style container. So all the CSS are inside style dot something, you find all the CSS properties. And you can read or set them. So we can do a lot of stuff, uh, but right now we cannot, uh, we don't know how to do it because we don't know when to run our code. Okay, all, everything that we can do on the DOM should be done when something happens, when some event happens. So this is the key point here, how to capture this event and how to define our own handlers, okay? So finally you can <laughs> um, answer to your question. Um, an event is generated by a node, by any element in the tree, can generate event. And depending on the type of node, it can generate different types of events. See? Uh, there are some events that are generated by every node and some events that are generated only by sub, some, for example, the submit event is only generated by buttons and forms, for example. And the click event is generated by any type of element. Um, there's one special event, for example, which is called uh, the load event on the window object. Window, remember, is a browser. And the browser loads the HTML page, and when it finishes, it will tell everybody the page is finished, has been loaded and it will generate a load event. So if we want to do something when the page uh, has been loaded, we can add, sorry, add an even listener to that object for listening to events of a specific type. Okay, so the syntax is object that generates the event, add the event listener of a type of event that we want to listen for. And the second argument, you guess, is a callback. They will do whatever is needed to process that event. The callback has one argument, which is the event object, an object that describe, uh, describes what happened. Um, I want to do something on pressing the mouse down on a link, so generally press a link, I want, uh, I click on a link and I want this link to highlight or to something, I can find, using the finding method to find, for finding the node reference, and on that specific node, not every link, on that specific link, I add an event listener of this event, where I'm, you know, logging the console, uh, which button were pressed or whatever. Okay, so this is the the programming mode. When the page loads, we are registering a lot of event handles. As it's the only say, synchronous code that we run. And then we let the event handles do their work uh, when they are called. The event object uh, is very simple. Well, it has many properties, but the two main most important ones are target and type. Okay, type is the type of event, so if we register for a load event, 
then even dot type will be log. It's useful only if we have the same handler to handle different types of events, which is quite uncommon. But more interesting is the target property, so event.target, that represents uh, the element uh, that generated the, the event itself. So the, hand, the event handler can know which is the element in which the user clicks, for example, or the user typed on event.target. Uh, Events, types, well, there are more than 100 different types of DOM events. Now, if you go here, you find a long list uh, that they try to report as a, as a small picture. You see that you can scroll down, and it will tell us uh, which events are generated by every type of element. Mouse click, there is a click event, for example. Double click event for the mouse uh, operations. For the keyboard operation, we have, we have a key down, key press, and key up. For the HTML page, we have a load event, for example, and so on. For the forms, uh, HTML forms, we have a set of events that uh, check when the user modifies something, enters into an input field, exits from the input field. We have focus and blur for that. We have change when the user changes. There's Every aspect of the browser operation is represented by different events. So it depends on what we want to, to, to check. Uh, we don't, of course, learn all the list. We work uh, with, the, with the smallest one, with the simplest one. Um, as we said, many events already have a default handler. So clicking on a link by default goes to a different page. If we want to prevent that, because we want to change the behavior, we can, in our event handler, our event handler will be called the before the default ones. So when you register an event handler, first it will run my code and then run the default one. If we don't want the default one to be executed because we want to override totally its behavior, we can call the prevent default method on the event. Okay, which is common. I want to do my stuff. I don't want the default behavior to, to be applied. And so we can start working on something concrete. Uh, everything starts when the page is loaded. Before the page is loaded, we have nothing to do. When the page is loaded, we can run some code, basically to set event handlers on part of the page. Or to fill some information inside the page. And basically, uh, all my code will be inside the event handler of an event that uh, uh, tells me that the page is ready. There are different uh, methods, different uh, events. One is window.load, window load, and the other is uh, document uh, DOM content loaded. Uh, the DOM content loaded will fire, will happen sooner because it will happen as soon as the DOM is built. What happens is that the DOM may contain some external resources like style sheets or um, images and uh, they will load in parallel. Maybe they will take some more milliseconds to load. When everything finishes loading, the window will emit the load event. So if I want to wait until everything has been loaded in the page, I will re react to the load event uh, from the window object. If I want to, as soon as the DOM is ready, even if some images are still loading, I will work on document uh, event uh, DOM content loaded. What does it mean I work with? So just let's make an, a simple example. Let's uh, uh, create a, a simple HTML file, index.html. And uh, with a simple script. So I'm creating an HTML file and a script uh, file. I call it script.js.
and uh, let's see what we can do. We have a simple web page when we have a title, maybe. And uh, a list, uh, for example, a list of items. Uh, let's say it's uh, today, somewhere. A very stupid HTML page that we can load in the browser like this, okay? So imagine that we want, when we click stupid behavior, when we click on hello, we add something in this list. Useless, but just to see the basic mechanism, right? And then we see, we'll move to something, some more interesting exercise, but let's get the basics first. So first, uh, we, have a script file <coughs> that's always work in script mode it's also in the browser we want to load the script uh, into the web page so inside the HTML head we insert the script uh, defer source uh, is uh, script.js So we basically add the script tag at the beginning of the document. And uh, to see whether it's actually running, we can maybe call a function that is called alert uh, that will open or pop up on the page. Uh, only use this for debugging, okay? No, never for any functionality. Okay, so I'm loading the script, and this script will be executed as soon as the page is loaded. And in this case, we are in the main body of the script, so we are in the sequential execution instruction. If we reload the page here, it will, of course, load the page and then open this uh, ugly pop-up here. Hi. So just we are sure that it's running. We are running the file, okay? The, we're loading it correctly. We didn't mangle the name or because the problem, the main problem is that uh, many errors go undetected here. Okay. So what, what we want to do is to attach an event handler to the title of the page that will do something with the list. What do we write the code? Okay, we could do something here. Um, let's do some stupid manipulation. Let's try to change the hello to something else, just to see how the DOM methods work. Let's try to do it synchronously for the moment. So, hello is inside uh, an H1 in the page. So I want to find uh, the node that contains that hello code. I have one way is to find uh, the hello uh, title with document uh, dot uh, get uh, element by tag name h1. Well, this gives me the list of all the h1s in the document. I only have one, so I pick the first. And then once I have the hello title, which is an HTML node, I can change the inner text, for example, to something in a different language. So I'm using the method for finding objects and for changing properties of those objects. If I run this page, if I load this page again, I see the title change. So I dynamically change the title after loading the page. Uh, 
I can do other stuff here. You see that uh, uh, it's a bit, uh, there's a strong dependency of the structure of the page uh, onto our code. Because if we add another title at the top, uh, then this selector won't work anymore. So it would be better, probably it would be more robust, uh, to, sorry, where's the code here? To tag the H1 with, for example, an ID. If we tag an ID or a class uh, to an element that may be useful also for styling, for style sheets, uh, then we, it will be much easier and much robust uh, just to use it by searching exactly that ID document dot get element by ID what's what's that with this ID that uh, I already forgot title heading Of course, it's working the same way, but if we are restructuring the page a bit, uh, it will still work. <coughs> and so we can do some manipulation on the page. Um, our best practice uh, should be, or we should be sure, to execute uh, these instructions. So in this case, it's very simple, but uh, in general, we are querying the document for an element we should be sure that the element is already there. We should be sure that the DOM has already been built. The differ attribute should do that for us. But more in general, it would be better not to execute any instruction until we are sure that the DOM is ready. So I, not, I don't want to execute this code or any code synchronously in the script, but I will always put uh, the code that you want to execute inside an event handler for the initial page load, for example. So all of this, should, so it means that I should uh, run this code asynchronously instead of synchronously when the script is loaded. When, maybe, maybe when the document dot we uh, register to the DOM content loaded event, huh? as we saw in the slide. So we add an event listener to the document on the DOM content loaded event and then we can have a callback and put our code inside the callback. So in this way we are more sure to run it in the right moment. In this case, we don't see any difference, of course. Hmm? But normally, you see, from the synchronous point of view, the only instruction that we execute is this one. We register, we ask the, docu the DOM to inform me when the page is ready. And at that point, I will run my code. And I'm sure the document is fully populated with all the nodes. Or window load is another event that come after. Okay? Okay, so what do we what did we want to do? We wanted to uh, let uh, this title to be clickable and to manipulate something in the list. So uh, we can Listen for the click event generated by the title, by the H1 element. So we can add, we can help. We already have the, the node, hello title, dot, add event listener, and we listen to the click event. of that node. 
when we click there, we do something. We add some item to the list of uh, items that we have there. How can we add this item? In well, okay, we must find the list. So const uh, the list is uh, the OIL tag, for example. We find the document dot get element by tag name of OIL. Maybe we have only this one, so we take the first. Remember that we when we search for tag name, we always get a list. Or usually in the you know, in the model code, we tend to use more CSS selectors. I, we, we, I would write a document dot get a query selector. OIL, which selects all the OL elements and already returns me the first one. If I want all of them, I would run query selector all. They will return a list. If I only want the first, these two are equivalent. And uh, I have, what is this list? Is a reference? Uh, let's say console.log list. So we see what happens in the browser before adding an element. Uh, let's try to be familiar what, with what is happening here. So whenever I'm clicking on the title, I find uh, this list uh, element, and now I'm writing something on the console. So what happens in the browser? If I open the browser, uh, where is it? Uh, I reload. I need to reload every time, of course, because I need to re refresh the JavaScript. Nothing seems to happen. Uh, if I yet open the inspector, Okay, the, we have the normal uh, inspector in the browser that we already play with for, uh, for creating HTML pages. What we have, uh, for example, <clears throat> what we see here is that it, maybe make it a bit larger if I, you see that the content of the page displayed here is already being updated by the JavaScript. So this is a live, in real time, representation of the console. This is not uh, the file that has been loaded. It is the file, uh, the current content of the DOM being displayed. So whenever we modify something, it's uh, updated in the real time, both in the inspector and in the page itself. And in the debugger section, we can find uh, our files, our script. And we have the, we have the source of the script, uh, we have a console in the bottom that can be displayed or hidden, usually with the ask key. We can also add some breakpoints here in the code in the browser. So first of all, let's try to click here. And we see that when we click here, something happens in the console. It's just printed OL, which is the representation of the object of type list that we refer to. Um, if I can add a breakpoint here, for example, if I click again on the page, the debugger kicks in, stops here, and here I can inspect, uh, sorry, if uh, this screen resolution is a bit difficult to see everything at the same time, but when, when I'm in a uh, in debugger, I can watch all the Variables, for example, here we have the list, uh, sorry, the list uh, that refers to an OL object, and we are, we, have, we have all the properties of this OL object. You see that there are hundreds of them. All the properties defined in the list. 
and there is, by the way, as some children. Where is the C? Child notes. It means that it has one, two, three children. Some space, the list item, another space. Text notes or element. And the list item notes by itself has some children. Child notes, it only has one child of type text that contains the data today. It's easy to get lost because we are navigating into a tree with a lot of properties, okay? But hopefully whenever we move on some node, we have this uh, icon that will highlight the HTML page on the other side. So we see that uh, in the debugger, every time we have a variable of type node, of type element, uh, it's synchronized with the browser. And uh, hello title is also available somewhere. Should sorry, my the global context. We have hello title. We see the closure here. This is the, is the context of, of my current function, and this is the context of the closure. So the function in which I'm defined. I can access also the information mm -hmm. or my arguments uh, and so on. In this case, it says optimize away because JavaScript understood that I, I, not, I don't need this anymore, so the variable has been deleted, but it's just a, a detail. So we can write, we can work, we can see the properties of the objects, and so I'll pass debugging that and see what is happening. Okay, let's uh, continue. So I remove the breakpoint and run it. Keep the bugger open. The last point uh, I want to do is uh, to add something to this line. So what we saw is that the list item contains, uh, sorry, the, the OL list contains a list item node. I want to add another one. So I need to create it, const uh, the, the new row. by creating a new node of type uh, li, list item document. I ask the, doc the document to create a node for me of type list item. In this row, I will add some text. And I will, I need to add this new node at the end of the current ones. Add a new child, a new child to the list. So it will be list dot append child with the row object. So like before, we saw that uh, the OL has a list of children and these children are texts which are in, that, in our case it was just blank or li we want to add an, another ally to the same OL. So in adding a new child to the list node. And this will happen any type, any time we click on the, on the type. So if there are no bugs, here when I click on the title, every time I click, a new line is created. So this is the, back, the basic mechanism. We wait for the page. We attach event handlers to every element we want to respond to. And in the body of these event handlers, you usually find some node somewhere and change some of the properties or add some new other nodes somewhere else. Okay, so what we are trying to do in the next hour, hopefully, is to work on our example of the Q&A. So I published uh, the full page with the CSS, 
and this for the moment is not uh, interactive at all. We have the buttons here, they are, the, they are color, they are layout, uh, but they don't do anything, it's just HTML. What we want to do is to add some behavior so that the vote button can uh, increase uh, the number or the list of questions is not, not just written in the HTML, but it's generated from a JavaScript array like we had before. So we try to add some interactivity and some dynamicity to this page in the, in the next hour. Hmm? So I think it's a good moment to make a, a break, hmm? and then we go on to, with the exercise. 